Hi everyone and welcome to this video all about the poem Tam O'Shanta which is in the AQA specification for comedy for those of you doing the comedy anthology. It's a collection, a small collection of seven poems all of which approach the theme of comedy from a different perspective. Uh, this is a video that uh, I only have left to do. Uh, no surprises that this one was kept till last because this is I suppose the most challenging poem to teach. Um, and also the longest poem of the collection as well, because it is a narrative poem, it tells a story. Um, but I'm pleased to finally be able to share this video with you. And I know many of you have been asking for it because you have perhaps been religiously watching the other six videos, but this was the gap. So hopefully this is going to go some way to filling that gap. Because this is a, a longer poem and because it's a narrative poem, I'm, I'm gonna have a different, slightly different structure for this video compared to the other poems. Uh, broadly speaking, it will be the same, but I'm going to start with talking about the key terms and literary concepts, which if you were to use any of those terms, you'd be getting AO1. Um, then I'm going to be talking about AO3, which is social and historical context. And then because this is a narrative poem, I'm going to make sure that we understand the story of this poem before we go into the poem specifically. So when I always teach this uh, poem to students, I uh, make sure that they know the story really well, rather than getting preoccupied with the complex Scottish dialect. If you know this poem already, uh, you will know that this poem is uh, trickier because it is written in Scottish dialect for the most part, which for English speaking students uh, can be a bit of a challenge. The way around that is I always get my students to get preoccupied with the story and where that part of the story happens in the poem, rather than trying to translate every single word. I used to do that when I started teaching this, um, and I quickly realised that the glossaries turned out to be five to six pages long. It was a laborious process, it was unnecessary, and it bombarded students with unnecessary information. So I don't actually now make too much of a, a big deal of translating every single word. Uh, for me, in teaching this poem, it's more about getting the gist of it and the story of it, rather than getting um, sidetracked by the actual language itself. So, uh, and then finally, what I will do with this video is I will then link to the comedy tradition uh, generally. Um, why has this poem been included on, this, in, on a comedy specification? And uh, what aspects of comedy do we see for AO4? So to begin with the key terms and literary concepts, if you were to use any of these bold terms here, you would be getting AO1 because they are terms that we typically use and which are associated with literary study. Uh, remember, and I must have said this, you know, almost a year ago now when I did the other videos of the poetry, that this is not a case of filling your essays with lots and lots of complex terminology. This is not about feature spotting. Um, this is more about knowing the, what the poems are about, the themes of them, and how they fit into comedy. It's not about, um, you know, shoehorning into your essays lots of complex terms, because the examiner will simply say, you're correct, but what are you telling me this for? So everything has to be to do with answering the question, making sure everything that you say is linked to the question and the task that they're going to give you. So you can see here we've got a list of terms. Um, some of them are already mentioned. Uh, we have got some pathetic fallacy in this poem regarding a storm, and that storm is metaphorically used to represent something else. We have a number of similes in the middle of the poem, and the poem is also written in rhyming couplets and iambic tetrameter, which together create a very rhythmical and almost celebratory tone to the poem. And because obviously there's a party in this poem, and because Tam is drunk, and the poem also starts in a pub, you can imagine that the writer wanted to create a very jolly sounding rhythm and rhyme to the poem. And that's exactly what happens. Going on to AO3, uh, the social and historical context. Uh, some of you might know this if you've already studied this poem, that there is a high degree of supernatural elements in this poem. And there's also a lot of Gothic imagery or horror imagery um, which harks back to folk tales, which would have been very common at the time, particularly in the Scottish uh, Highlands where this poem is set in the town called Eyre, which would have entertained but also terrified the audiences uh, of the 18th century. 
The poem was published uh, in 1791, and it could also be considered to be autobiographical, because Burns also was known for having a fondness for drinking, but also womanising. You could also link the depiction of gender roles in this, in this uh, poem regarding Tam O'Shanter's perhaps foolish male bravado, which has been spurred on by uh, drunkenness, but also how the advice, which almost turns out to be true actually from Tam's wife Kate, how actually that advice is dismissed in favour of the men enjoying themselves after a busy market day. The poem ends with a didactic message. It's supposed to teach us something, although arguably it could also be seen as ironic. And you could also use this poem to talk about the behaviours of the lower classes, particularly uncultivated and excessive behaviour, which perhaps lacks the refinement of other poems in the collection, such as My Rival's House, for example. Uh, you could also talk about the importance of Scottish identity in this poem. We have Scottish dialects, we have a Scottish setting, um, you know, a, a, an importance of Scottish folk tales, and a rejection of England, France and America, shown, for example, through the type of music and instruments that are being played in the church in Kirk Alloway later on in the poem. So, like I said, whenever I teach this poem to students, I always start with making sure students know the story, because this is a narrative poem. It's quite a bizarre narrative poem um, because of the events of it and, and the imagery. Um, but it's a relatively simple story. Uh, and if you can, if you're able to remember the story, you should be able to relatively quickly, despite the Scottish dialect, be able to locate and navigate yourself around the poem to be able to find the bits of the poem that you want to talk about. So very simply, what I would do in class is I would cut, get students to cut out these strips, I wouldn't include the numbers, and I would get them to order them and stick them down so they knew what happened when, and that obviously forming the narrative. So one night, Tam came riding on, his, on a horse from Ayr, a market town, it's the end of a busy market day, and as tradition dictated in this small market town, uh, men usually went to the pub afterwards to celebrate all of their earnings and profits. Chances are they put most of them behind the bar in the till. And everybody gets very, very drunk. And he ignores his wife's Kate's advice, who says, if you're not careful, you're going to do yourself harm. He almost does, obviously, in this poem. And in that, in that pub, he's very high spirited. He's enjoying talking to his friends. And but the pub closes. Uh, last orders, the pub closes, and Tam has to go home. Um, no car, no taxi, couldn't call an Uber. He had to get on his horse called Maggie, and it was stormy, and he had to go home and had to ride home in this storm. As he was going, though, because he was drunk, he was in very high spirits, he didn't really notice the storm. Um, he was singing Scottish songs, so very, very jolly. But as he got to the church known as Kirk Alloway in this poem, he looked in that church and noticed that there were lights on inside in the middle of the night. Because he's lost all his inhibitions from drinking, he coaxes his horse Maggie near to the ruins so he could look inside. And when he does look inside, he notices that there's lots of supernatural beings in that church having a party. Ghosts, witches, warlocks. Uh, the devil is in there as well. And the party is getting louder and louder and more raucous. Tam, because of his drunken state, uh, began to lust after one of the witches, and he forgot himself, and he shouted out, Wheel done, Cutty Sark. And after that, everything goes pretty black quite quickly, and the witches start to chase him to the bridge. The belief was at the time that supernatural deities cannot cross running water. So in order to survive and avoid all harm, Tam had to make his way to the bridge, and the keystone of the bridge is the middle stone of the arch of a bridge. He did, he got there in the end, but unfortunately the witch got so close, called Nanny, got so close to the horse Maggie that the witch pulled off Maggie's tail and left behind a stump. But Tam um, managed to survive in the end, and that is also when we get the moral of the story to do with uh, drinking and remembering this story if you want to drink to excess.
So that is the story. It's a bizarre story. It's an absurd story. But then again, that's what we might expect from a comedy specification. So that is the English translation. And then what I do with my students is I get them to then start to play around with the Scottish translation or the Scottish original version. So these slips of paper here are exactly the same as the last slide that I showed you, but we're now using quotes from the actual poem itself. And we're starting to associate particular elements of the story to the, the, um, to the Scottish version. So I'm not going to go through that. You can obviously pause this now if you want to. But there we have the Scottish version of, of the story uh, in the Scottish language. Unlike previous videos where I went through the poem and highlighted and annotated with arrows and things, I haven't done that with this poem because it's so long. Instead, what I've done is I've given you the Scottish version on the left and given you the English version on the right. And then what I've done at the end of this presentation is dedicate one slide to talking about all of the perhaps language, the symbolism, the structure, and I put it all together at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, I'm going to read through the English version so you get a gist of the rhyming uh, and the rhythm and the and the substance really of the poem. And then I'll go through particular significant authorial methods for AO2 at the end. OK, so it says when peddler people leave the streets and thirsty neighbours, neighbours meet as market days are wearing late and folk begin to take the road home whilst we sit boozing on strong ale and getting drunk and very happy. We don't think of the long Scots miles, the marshes, waters, steps and styles that lie between us and our home. Where sits a sulky, annoyed wife, gathering her anger like a gathering storm, nursing her wrath to keep it warm. Here we find honest Tam O'Shanter, as he from air one night did canter, old air which never a town surpasses, for honest men and bonny lasses. O oh, Tam, had you been so wise as to have taken your own wife Kate's advice, she told you that you were a waster, a rambling, blustering, drunken boaster, that from November until October, each market day you were never sober. During each milking period with the miller, you sat as long as you had money. For every horse he put a shoe on, the blacksmith and you got roaring drunk on. That at the Lord's house, even on Sunday, you drank with Kirkton and Jean until Monday. She prophesied that sooner or later you would be found drowned in the dune, or caught by warlocks in the murk by Alloway's old haunted church. Ah, gentle ladies, it makes me cry. Think how many counsels sweet, how much detailed and wise advice the husband from his wife ignores. But to our tale, one market night, Tam was seated just right, next to a fireplace blazing finely, with creamy ales that tasted divinely. And at his elbow, Cobbler Johnny, his ancient trusted thirsty friend, Tam loved him like a brother. They had been drunk for weeks together. The night drove on with songs and clatter, and every ale was tasting better. The landlady and Tam grew gracious, with secret favours sweet and precious. The cobbler told his queerest stories. The landlord's laugh was like a chorus. Outside the storm might roar and rustle. Tam did not mind the storm a whistle. It was mad to see a man so happy, even drowned himself in ale. As bleas fly home with loads of treasure, the minutes winged their way with pleasure. Kings may be blessed, but Tam was glorious over all the ills of life victorious. But pleasures are like poppies spread, you seize the flower, its bloom is shed. Or like the snow falling on a river, a moment it's white, then melts forever. Or like the aurora borealis rays, that move before you can point to their place. Or like a rainbow's lovely form, vanishing amid the storm. No man can stop time nor tide, the hour approaches where Tam must ride. That hour of night's black arch, the keystone, that dreary hour he mounts his horse in. As, and such a night he takes to the road in, as never a poor sinner had been put out in. The wind blew as it had blown its last, rattling showers rose on the black. The speedy gleams the darkness swallowed, loud, deep and long the thunder bellowed. That night a child might understand, the devil has business on his hands. While mounted on his grey horse Meg, there was never such a great horse. Tam raced on through mud and mire, despising wind and rain and fire. Whilst holding on to his good blue bonnet, whilst singing some old Scots sonnet, whilst glowering round with prudent care, lest ghosts catch him unaware, Alloway's church was drawing near, 
where ghosts and owls gave a nightly cry. But this time he was across the ford, where in the snow the peddler got smothered, and past the birch trees and the huge stone, where drunken Charlie broke his neck bone, and through the thorns and past the monument, where hunters found the murdered child, and near the branch above the well, where Mungo's mother hung herself, before him the river dune pours all his floods, the strengthening storm roars through the woods, the lightning flashes from pole to pole, nearer and more near the thunder rolls, when glimmering through the groaning trees, Alloway's church seemed ablaze, through every gap light beams were glancing, and mirth sounded loudly and dancing. Inspiring old Jarley, John Barleycorn, what dangers you can make us scorn, with air we fear no evil, with whiskey we'll face the devil. So the owls all swam in Tam's head. Fair play, he didn't give a jot about devils. But Maggie stood completely astonished until Tam, using his heel and hand, she ventured forward on the light. And wow, Tam saw an incredible sight. Warlocks and witches in a dance, not a cotillion, brand new from France, but hornpipes, jigs, strathspeys and reels, which put life and metal in their heels. In a window alcove in the east, there sat old Nick in shape of a beast, a shaggy dog, black, grim and large, to give their music was his charge. He played the pipes and made them squeal, until roof and rafters all did ring. Coffins stood round like open presses, that showed the dead in their latest dresses, and by some devilish magic slight, each in its cold hand howled a light. By which Eric Tam was able to note upon the holy table a murderer's bones in giblet irons, two feet long, small, unchristened babies, a thief just cut from the, his hanging rope, with his last scarf his mouth did gape, five tomahawks with blood red rusted, five schematas with murder crusted, a garter with which a baby was strangled, a knife that a father's throat had mangled, whom his own son of life bereft, the grey hair still stuck to the knife, with more of the horrible and awful, which even to name would be unlawful. As Tammy glowered, amazed and curious, the mirth and fun grew fast and furious, the piper loud and louder blew, the dancers quick and quicker flew, they reeled, they set, they crossed, they linked, till every witch sweated and smelled, and cast her ragged clothes to the floor, and danced deftly in her underskirt. Now, Tam, had these been young girls, all plump and strapping in their teens, their underskirt, instead of being creased, was snow white and of the finest quality, the trousers of mine, my only pair, that once were plush of good blue hair, I would give—I would have given them off my buttocks for one blink of those pretty girls. But withered hags, old and droll, ugly enough to suckle a foal, leaping and flinging on a stick, it's a wonder it didn't make you sick. But Tam knew what was well enough. There was one winsome jolly wench that night enlisted in the corps, long after known on Carrick shore. For many a beast she shot dead, and perished many a bonny boat, and shook much corn and barley, and kept the countryside in fear. Her short underskirt of paisley cloth, that while the young lass she had worn, in longitude through very limited, it was her best, and she was proud. Ah, little knew your reverend granny, that skirt she bought for her little granddaughter, with two Scots pounds, it was all her riches, would ever grace the dance of witches. But here my story must stoop and bow, such words are far beyond her power. To sing how Nanny leaped and kicked, a supple youth she was and strong, and how Tam stood bewitched and thought his very eyes enriched. Even Satan glowered and was full of lust and played the music even louder. Till first one caper, then another, Tam lost his reason altogether and roars out, well done, cut his sark. And in an instant all was dark and scarcely had he Maggie rallied when out the hellish legion sallied. As bees buzz out with angry wrath, when plundering herd to sail their hive, as a wild hare's mortal foes, when pop, she starts running before their nose, as eager runs the market crowd, when catch the thief resounds aloud, so Maggie runs, the witches follow, with many an unearthly scream and holler. Ah, Tam, ah, Tam, you'll get what's coming, in hell they'll roast you like a herring, in vain your Kate awaits your coming, Kate will soon be a woeful woman. Now do your speedy utmost, Meg, and beat them to the keystone of the bridge. There you may toss your tail at them, a running stream they dare not cross. But before the keystone she could make, she had to shake a tail at the fiend. For Nanny, far before the rest, 
hard upon noble Maggie pressed, and flew at Tam with furious aim, but little did she know of Maggie's mettle. One grab missed Tam completely, but left behind Maggie's own grey tail. The witch caught her by the rump, and left poor Maggie scarce a stump. Now, who this tale of truth shall read, each man and mother's son, take heed. Whenever to drink you are inclined, of short skirts run in your mind, think you may buy joys over dear. Remember Tam O'Shanter's mare. Okay, so that is the um, the English version of the poem, and hopefully you can obviously go back and look back at the Scottish equivalents. But that is the story. Uh, very bizarre, very absurd, um, and very supernatural in places, and also quite gruesome in places as well. But hopefully you can now see the link between the narrative of the story that I went through in that grid earlier to the actual um, poem itself. So moving on then to AO2, which is authorial methods, and like I said, rather than giving you annotations as we go, I decided to put them all this time on one slide. As we said, we've got iambic tetrameter and rhyming couplets, which creates a lively atmosphere, which is mimicking the mood of celebration, which you would expect in a party. At times, as I was reading it, you could have heard how the rhythm started to speed up at times, particularly when the party in the church was getting more and more raucous and out of control. Uh, it's not uh, Burns speaking in this poem, or even Tam speaking, it's, a, it's an invented speaker. And the speaker seems to continually take pleasure in telling us the story, uh, who seems to flick between seeing Tam as both heroic, but also as quite foolish. Um, I put the same one twice there, haven't I? Never mind. Um, and use of exclamatives to show the speaker's delight in telling the tale. Um, clearly, the use of exclamative sentences shows that there is um, an ability for the um, for the speaker to really kind of enjoy telling us this story. The setting is important in this um, in this um, poem as well because it's a very strong Scottish setting. You've got the pub, you've got air, you've got the Kirk Alloway, the bridge. So this poem is very heavily to do with the area at which the poem is set in Scotland as well. We could also say that the speaker speaks with irony here. For example, the speaker says that Tam is both heroic, ironically, at the beginning, and then says he's a drunken, blustering, blethering Blenheim. That kind of alliteration there reinforces that this is a speaker who, on the one hand, is probably seeing Tam as a bit of a lovable rogue, as a bit of a scoundrel. Um, there is innuendo and borderness, as expected of the comedic tradition, um, which is quite surreal. Um, the gathering storm could represent a pathetic fallacy of his wife's anger at his behaviour. She has said constantly, Tam, if you're not careful, you're going to get yourself into trouble because of your drinking. You're going to cause yourself great harm. That almost happens here, um, but uh, she isn't listened to. There's a lot of beautiful similars, actually, in the middle of this poem to do with snowflakes and poppies and rainbows and the northern lights which all come together to suggest that um, human pleasure is often fleeting and short lived. So just like, you know, poppies don't last very long, just like snowflakes disappear on water, rainbows don't hang around forever. Um, it means that this idea, this, this heightened sense of enjoyment and pleasure won't last forever, uh, which is obviously caused by drunkenness. And you could also say, because this is a narrative poem, the story follows a traditional exposition, rising action, climax and a new month structure, which means we almost have this kind of narrative arc going on. The climax obviously being Tam calling out that phrase, Will done Cutty Sark, where he gets carried away and because of his drunkenness he loses all of his inhibitions. So that's just what I've grouped on there as I've grouped together some of the pointers for analysis for AO2. Moving on to AO4, uh, what aspects of comedy do we see? Uh, we see these Obviously, drunkenness is a comedic aspect because it can change people's behaviour and make them more irrational and unpredictable. Uh, it can also make them quite foolish. There's a degree of supernatural elements here. The dysfunctional relationship between, excuse me, between uh, Tam and his wife could also be something that you could use in a question, perhaps. There is a happy resolution in the sense that Tam survives. He escapes all harm. His horse doesn't, but he does. Uh, a high degree of farce and absurdity just because of what is parting inside the church, but also the chaos and confusion as he escapes the witch's chase. 
there is a degree of sexual innuendo and lust, uh, particularly towards the witches, which again in itself is ridiculous because witches aren't known for their beauty. Um, comedy is often about human errors and foibles and shortcomings and flaws and using that as a source of mockery. So clearly here, Tam, despite being the protagonist and perhaps the anti-hero of, um, of this poem, we do really laugh at him or find his behaviour humorous because of his foolishness. And finally, the unity of time and place, togetherness and celebration, as we might expect from the comedic tradition, uh, that sense of um, revelry in high spirits. Finally, why has this poem been included on a comedy specification? Well, it's a story which is full of farce, that should say. Full of farce, buffoonery, hyperbole, conviviality, borderness, chaos and absurdity, so all of those elements are in there. You could argue that the Scottish dialect sharpens the comedy um, and the drunkenness as well because it foregrounds Tam's shortcomings and his flaws. Um, like I said at the beginning, for social and historical context, you could use this poem as a depiction of the uncultivated behaviours of the lower classes, excessive drinking, lusting over women, camaraderie, flirtation, loss of inhibitions. The supernatural elements add a degree of surrealism and just an element of bizarreness to the um, to the proceedings. The depiction of the Gothic and the supernatural is also quite ridiculous. Uh, you've got, you know, old Nick playing the bagpipes there, which is quite absurd in itself, when you consider that Nick is supposed to be seen as quite a, a horrific figure. And like we said, we do have a happy resolution for Tam. Uh, he survives and lives to see another day. Whether he's learned from this is another issue. You would think that if he had any wits about him, he would learn from this to avoid it happening again or change his behaviour, but we might not see that. Um, again, what I would argue that is he's not supposed to be seen as, as um, somebody to detest, even though his behaviour is quite irritating, maybe, or quite irresponsible. He's more of a scoundrel or a likeable fool that you would sometimes find with minor stock characters in a Shakespeare play, for example. The way that Tam disobeys Kate's advice hints at the dysfunctional, so if you were to get a question about dysfunctional relationships, this could be a poem to use. The party at the church, uh, as we said, is creating a sense of togetherness, partying and revelling in high spirits. And finally, you know, there's also a high degree of relatability. It is argued that comedy has far higher relatability than tragedy because comedy is often about every one of us. It's about what it is to be human. And perhaps most of us know what it is to go out. And most of us perhaps know what it's like to go to a pub and a bar. And many of us might know what it's like to get drunk and what happens to our behaviour or the behaviour of others when we do get drunk. So because of that knowledge that we're bringing to the poem, this poem might speak to us more because of that high degree of relatability. OK, so that concludes this video tutorial about Tam O'Shanter. I hope that is useful. Um, please feel free to go back and look at the modern translation to help you understand the story and then begin to look at some particular points for analysis. Thank you.